This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am where the Word says I am. I am seated right now in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive, as I am taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Now give someone a high five standing next to you, and then you may be seated. I see some of y'all not giving high fives out there. Y'all too cool for a high five or what? Amen. Amen. Well, we got an awesome message for you this morning in this series, How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. And the message entitled this morning is Dealing with the Threats of the Wicked. Dealing with the Threats of the Wicked. And you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 36, Isaiah chapter 36, and we got a testimony uh, that deals perfectly, that goes in with this message, so I'm going to read this testimony to you first, and then we will deal with the passage in the Bible. Uh, As recent as last year, I've been working for the same company for 20 years, and God has blessed my work, and I enjoyed success there, but even though I was thankful for the occasional promotions and above average increases, they were incremental and not uh, and not the changing levels kind of success and prosperity that Pastor talks about. How many are looking forward to changing levels? Amen. Amen. During the 2018 Easter Challenge offering, I felt strongly in my spirit this was our opportunity to change levels. I had seen the limits of what I could perform, produce with my own strength, but I wanted to see what we could accomplish by doing it God's way and by doing what Pastor said to do. My wife and I made the biggest commitment we've ever made, sow to seed and start believing God and confessing that God will make a way for extra money to come in to meet the commitment and to change levels. The sessions from the 2018 Holy Week Revival were critical in helping me renew my mind, especially the noon sessions on prayer that gave me the framework on how to formulate my prayer list and how to pray. I created my list and started praying and confessing them consistently together with Pastor's Confession Book. About six months, everybody say about six months. months. How many know everybody's looking for a quick fix? But how many know slow and steady always wins the race, amen? Amen. You gotta be faithful. There is a, you know faithfulness is is a weapon of the Spirit of God, do you realize that? It's a weapon to use that keeps you focused and keeps you going. Six months later, he made, after he made that commitment, my company announced they would be making organizational changes to reduce staff and offered a severance package for anyone who volunteered to leave. In my 20-year tenure, I've heard, of a, I've, heard of a, I've heard of a voluntary package being offered only once before. My package would be about one and a half times my annual salary plus other benefits. This opportunity didn't come out without risk as I haven't searched or interviewed for a job in 20 years. I consulted pastor who encouraged me to pray and follow the peace And he also gave me practical advice. That's what we always say. We always say, follow the peace of God. Follow the peace of God. After much prayer and discussion, my wife and I agreed to take the offer, and we informed our pastors on our decision, and pastors spoke over me that I'll have the mind of Christ when I shop my resume, and the next job will be better. The same week, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, saying that I would receive a two-for-one, a promotion, and a harvest. I recall pastors saying that when you take action on your dream, get ready for a battle. And that was the case as numerous times my managers asked me to withdraw my decision. Now, how many of how many y'all begin to realize and understand that the world is not really for your success and prosperity? Have you, anybody ever come to understanding this? You know, the world is not really out there to be your cheerleader. As a matter of fact, they don't want to see you succeed and they don't want to see you prosper. So they kept pouring out fear and providing reasons to not take the package. When I stood fast, they escalated with threats of rejecting my decision. We kept praying and confessing what we wanted, being in agreement and standing on what the Holy Spirit and pastor has said. This took a few months, but finally my managers reluctantly approved my decision at the end of 2018. Everybody say a few months. months. How many of y'all can wait a few months to get your harvest? Amen. 
Fast forward another six months, and I left the company at the end of June of 2019, and in July, we reaped our biggest harvest and gave our biggest tithe check ever, and it was such a joy. Everybody say, such a joy. How many of y'all know tithing is a joy, amen? amen? Especially when you give your biggest tithe check ever, right? That's a joy, right? And it was so wonderful to see what God had done. Miracle number one, praise God. I started applying for jobs month be months before leaving, over 100 job applications. I went to as many industry and networking meetings as I could, and I spoke with many recruiters, executives and managers in various companies. I also spent a lot of time studying, learning new skills and tools. Now, what did this, what did this person do? He didn't just have a faith goal. He didn't just believe, he wasn't just believing to receive that faith goal. He was also putting things in what? In action. He was putting action along with his faith. So as he was doing job, uh, job interviews, he was improving himself, he was learning new things, he was, he, he was putting a plan in to action. Everybody say this, say, God blesses, God blesses. the works of my hands. Amen. So you got to get out there and do what? You got to work. Well, from June to early August, I made it to the last stage of interviews for five different companies, but didn't receive any job offers. It was a daily discipline. Everybody say daily discipline. Daily discipline. To walk by faith and not by sight, as sometimes I felt the emotional pressure from seeing living expenses and back to school expenses start chewing on our severance money. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. You feel great and then expenses come along and you're like, okay, Lord. I guess I'm the only one. All right. <laughs> also, I've never been unemployed before and had to cast down thoughts that perhaps I had made a mistake. It took a lot of effort to discipline my mouth, and it does take a lot of effort to discipline our mouths, doesn't it? To not complain or say anything negative, but to say what I wanted. But look what he says here. There are many things that helped me get through this season. Number one, my wife's encouragement that God had a better job on the way and not to settle for less. Husbands, turn to your wives and say, thank you for being my biggest support. Husbands, turn to your wives and say, thank you. Even if you guys say it by faith, say it by faith. Husbands, turn to your wives and say, thank you for being my biggest support. Oh my gosh. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. I mean, y'all know it's important who you marry, amen? That you're together, that you're in agreement. And then that, number two, being in church as often as possible. Number three, pastor's confession book. Number four, my prayer and confession list that he learned from the 2018 noon prayer sessions. Number five, standing on what the Holy Spirit and the pastor spoke to me. Number six, reading Oral Roberts' book, Miracle of Seed Faith. Number seven, dancing before the Lord. Number eight, practice laughing at the devil. So he was busy. Amen? Listen, if you would be more busy with doing things and serving the Lord than you are worrying about all those other things, everything would turn out all right. I said, if you would be more busy, focused on the things that you can control, that you do, and your relationship with the Lord and serving Him, and stop forgetting about what's, what's going on all around you, your life would be a lot better. Amen? Amen. Number nine, he received encouragement. He read the Dominion Principle. He was in a champion builders group. Pastor wrote in that book, his workbook, in all these years, we have never seen anyone who is in church three times a week at Faith Christian Center and have any unemployment lasted more than a few days. So he was doing things, doing things, busy, 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 not crying, not whining, not looking at his wife going, woe is me, what, what is God doing? No, he was busy, busy, busy doing all the right things. Everybody say the right things. How about this? During the offering time in the services, I heard about not waiting until my harvest comes in before giving into the challenge offering, but to take action now. I heard this before without taking much, listen to what he says there. I heard this before without taking much action, but one day it just clicked in my spirit and I decided to ramp up my giving. It just clicked. You know, the Bible tells James 1.22, do not be hearers only and so deceive yourselves, but do what it is says. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're glad you're here this morning. Turn to the other neighbor and say, that's step one. Right? The second step is you got to listen. You can't go in daydreaming while I'm talking, right? You got to stay focused and you got to listen. But the third thing is not just to hear what's being said, but then to let it click in your spirit and put action to it. Put action to it. So he said that uh, I've heard this before without taking much action, but one day it just clicked on my spirit. I decided to ramp up my giving. Though this didn't make logical sense, 
as I didn't have a new job yet, right? That doesn't make logical sense, but he did it. I started sowing larger than usual seeds. What has Pastor been telling us? What has Dr. Austin been telling us? Next level commitment brings next level giving, right? I mean, you got to be a next level giver before you're going to have that next level expectation. And that's what he did. Two days later, I received a call from a recruiter for a job that I didn't apply for, and this was job was a promotion. Another few days later, I received a call from another company. The recruiter said I had applied for one job, a lateral position, but she said I would be better suited for another job, a promotion. I went through all the interviews for both companies and saw God's favor and blessing. In early September, I had two job offers. Multiple offers was one of my confessions. Both jobs were promotions at the executive level, both with more pay, one 20% more, another 40% more with more better, with better benefits. Miracle number two, praise God. I ever say praise the Lord, amen? How many of y'all rejoice with this family in the church, amen? But wait, wait, there's more to it. Listen to this. After selecting the latter position and negotiating my pay and bonus, I was told by that recruiter that there was a new person in the compensation department that objected to my bonus structure because they thought that I didn't deserve that much. Anybody ever had someone on the job that, that felt like they were just out to get you? Anybody had someone that feels like they're sabotaging your every move? Well, listen to this. I received this news the Friday before the September power lunch. By now I had seen God perform two miracles and saw that faith works. I stood on Matthew 17, 20 and commanded that objection to be removed and sowed a seed in the pastor's life during the power lunch. The following Monday, the recruiter called me saying they resolved the issue over the weekend that I would receive a full year's bonus even though I'd only worked the last quarter of the year. I heard later that the hiring manager told the compensation person that it was his budget and he'll pay whatever he wants. Yeah, amen is right, yes? Oh, if that happened on your job, y'all would be a little bit more excited than that, right? We wouldn't be getting a golf clap. We'd be getting a hallelujah jumping up and down, right? And then he goes on and gives the scriptures that he's given praise to the Lord. Thank you, pastors, for teaching and showing us how to take action on God's word, especially for the 2018 Holy Week Revival teachings, for speaking success over us and giving us practical advice, for leading by example, for giving us the opportunity to make a commitment to stretch our faith, for teaching us how to walk by faith and not by sight, for showing us that God's blessings and promises are for us and to confess them until they come to pass in our lives and for showing us the power of seed faith and expectation. Without all this, we would not have been able to change levels. 2019 is truly our best year yet, a year of increase, healing, miracles, and victory. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout of victory this morning. Amen. Amen. All that. You say, well, what was it? It was all of it, right? It was all of it. You want God to bless you, you got to be committed to him. You got to be committed to his word, and you got to be committed to what he's saying. So sometimes, you know, I've been, I've been trying to share this with the teenagers to show them that, look, when you're believing God, that doesn't mean everything's just going to come easily. When you're, as a matter of fact, when you're believing God, more than likely you're going to have opposition. You're going to have to be an overcomer. You can't just let there and sit there and expect everything just to go hunky-dory all the time. You're going to have to stand on the Word of God. There are some people you're going to have to ignore. There's some people you're going to have to connect to. There's some things you're going to have to do. There's some praying you're going to have to do. There's some words you're going to have to learn. There's some confessions you're going to have to have coming out of your mouth. There's some music you're going to have to stop listening to. There's some things that you're going to have to do in order to be an overcomer. It just does not happen automatically. And when God calls us an overcomer, we want to be overcomers without overcoming anything. It's not the way it works. Turn to and say, that's not the way it works. So let's look, at this, let's look at this example in the Old Testament to see how to deal, how to deal with the threats of the wicked. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to do some reading in the Bible this morning and to set this story up. So just stick with me here in Isaiah chapter 36. We're going to start in verse 1. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. He attacked how many of the cities of Judah? All. And how many did he capture? He captured all of them. Everybody say, this is a bad deal. This, this is a bad deal, right? Verse 2. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army of Lachesh to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. 
When the commander stopped at the aqueduct or the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field, Elohim, son of Hilkah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to him. The field commander said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says. So what would happen is, whenever they were being besieged or whenever they were about to go to war, they would have this, they would send out a party that would try to either come with a compromise or to see what's going on. So they're being sent out, and this underling of the king of Assyria comes out and says this to them. He says, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says, on what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say that you have strength and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? You ever met somebody that had a God complex? You know what I mean by God complex? They thought they were God. Y'all have never met someone? You'll never had a boss like that? Anybody ever had a boss that had a God complex? Okay. Verse 6. Look now, you are depending on Egypt, the splintered reed of a staff which pierces a, ha- a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And what he was telling them is, look, y'all are depending on Egypt. And we don't have time to look at it this morning. But when you read the Old Testament, when you read Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, when you read through it, you find out that one of the things that really irritated God, I mean, it really irritated him, was when the people of God looked to Egypt in time of famine instead of looking to the Lord as their source. And so God wants to be your source. How much of the time? All the time. Everybody say, all the time. How much time does God want to be your source? All the time. time. When things look great, he wants to be your source. When things don't look so great, he still wants to be your what? Your source. Verse 7. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? Now I want you to know something here. He is misrepresenting what has happened in Judah. King Hezekiah, what King Hezekiah did is King Hezekiah removed all false gods. And he removed all altars to false gods. So this guy is saying a statement about Judah that he doesn't even understand and realize. This is what what wicked people do. Have you ever had a wicked person try to whip you with the Bible and they have no idea what they're talking about? The, The main one you hear all the time is, well, God said, do not judge. That's so out of context, it's unreal. So, and they, they, what are they trying to do? Make you feel bad so that you what? So that you back up. But God doesn't want you to back up. God wants you to stand up. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God doesn't want you to back up. God wants you to what? To stand up. So he was saying, well, who's Hezekiah going to do this? He's, he's removed all the, I mean, he's removed everything. He's done everything. No, what Hezekiah did is what God wanted him to do. He got, I mean, can you imagine could you imagine if you came in this church and we had a golden altar here to Oprah or we had a golden altar to, to, to some, I mean, could you imagine, I mean, the confusion that would reign, right? We're not here to worship you. We're not here to worship me. We're here to worship our father, God and his son, Jesus and his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So this is what the wicked people like to do. They like to try to whip you with biblical things that they have no idea. That's why we spent about two and a half years in a a series, what did Jesus really say? And it's on the app, and you can go back and listen to it, but that's why we did that. It's because, you know, people misrepresent what Jesus says all the time. Verse 8, come now, make a bargain with my master. Make a what? Make a what? Bargain. Bargain. You know... And in this, in our nation today, how many of y'all know that in our nation today, there is a spirit of antichrist loosed in our nation today? You know, when I was in, when I was in high school, if you would have told me that our culture would be doing what it is doing today, I would have laughed at you and said, you're just a fear monger. You're just trying to be Mr. Apocalypto. You know, you're just trying to, you're just trying to bring about, talk about the end of the world. But here we are. Here we are. 
And it's not, just a, it's not just a spirit of, we want to do what we want to do. It's a spirit of, we want to do what we want to do, and we want you to feel bad about what you do, and we want you to shut up about what you do. And we, I mean, it's a spirit of Antichrist. I didn't say it was the Antichrist. I said it's the spirit of the Antichrist is loose in this land. And they always want you to compromise. They don't want to compromise but they want you to compromise, right? Their tolerance is, 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 is a misdefinition. Their tolerance is tolerance as long as it fits into their deal, but they're not really going to tolerate you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, right? And, he, and here's what I've learned. I've learned this from Pastor Lerd from the Bible, that if I can't please him, why try please him? I, I, I can't please you. I'm there, my life... My life is about serving God. That's what my life is, about serving God. So that's who I'm trying to please. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, I have come out to attack and destroy this land without the Lord. Excuse me. Furthermore, have I come out to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? Now, here's we, here we got another lesson right here, right? Whenever someone comes along and says they've been sent by the Lord to himself to steal, kill, and destroy in your life, you know that they're lying. You know they're lying. And let me tell you something else that's very tricky about our culture and society today. Our culture and our society is very spiritual. They are very spiritual without serving the true God. And they'll, they'll mask it in all kinds of languages. Oh, you know, I believe in God as well. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah, I believe in love. What are you talking about? I mean, describe to me this God that you believe in. With love. Besides that, love. I mean, they can't, they can't come. I mean, because it's all, it's all this spiritual mumbo gumbo that, you know, and they, they never get down to specifics. It's all this, this big, this, you know, this, this thing that just, it just, it just, it's, it, they, they can't, they can't pin it down because they're not really serving God. They're serving spirituality. They're trying to make things spiritual without having God in it. And it's, it doesn't work. Turn to everybody and say, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Amen. How many of y'all know it doesn't work? Yes? And besides, you know, people come along all the time and try to wrap things in spirituality. I had a guy one time, several years ago, started coming to the youth group, wanted to be a help to the youth group. He was a college-age person. He came to me after service one time. He says, the Lord spoke to me. I said, oh, really? What did he say? I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> the Lord told me that you're to preach, and then I'm to lay hands on people, and then, the, you know, that's, that's the way we're supposed to run things. You preach, and then I'll, I, I, I barely met this guy. So you know what I told him? Get lost. God didn't let, God, I'm in charge of this youth group, and God never told me that. Don't you, I spend time praying. Don't you think God would tell me? Right? See, so many people are looking for words from people. You have the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of you. You pray. You have the Word of God. You have the Word of God. You have everything you need. When someone speaks to you, it's a word of confirmation. It's, it should be a word of confirmation. If it's not a word of confirmation, chunk it out the window and say, then forget about it. Turn over and say, just forget about it. Right? Just forget about it. So we see here that, you know, he tries to cloak it again in this thing of the word of God. Look back at verse 10 again. Let's start, start verse 10. Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Well, that's a lie. Then Eliakim Shimba and Joah said to the field, field commander, please speak to your servants. I love this. Please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in, hearing of the pe in the hearing of the people on the wall. So what were they concerned about here? They were concerned. They said, please use a different language because these threats you're making against us, we don't want the people around to hear it. Because how many of y'all know that might hurt morale just a little bit, right? But, the, but he has, he's not going to do that. But the commander replied, verse 12, Was it only your master, that you're my master's servant, me to say these things, and not to men sitting on the wall, who, like you, will have to eat their own filth 
and drink their own urine. Now, in America, we have a hard time thinking about this, but you know, you think you're in a tough situation. Think about King Hezekiah. His city's being surrounded. He's in charge. He's got all those people depending on him. And there they are. If you know anything historically about when cities are under siege, it's not a pretty sight. They don't let food through. They don't let things, they don't let things go through. If you ever studied the Civil War, you know uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi was a stronghold on the Mississippi River. And so the North Army surrounded it, sieged it, and they were trying to get them to surrender. And many times, and then in many of the notes or many of the journals of the, of the generals and the, uh, the soldiers, they could tell that the siege was working when animals started disappearing. They could tell the siege was working when cats and dogs and rats started disappearing. Because when you are under siege, everything starts to look good. Right? You don't, I mean, I mean, it's a bad situation. And it was so bad that they were drinking their own urine and eating their own feces. Now, some of y'all say, I would never do that. Well, you've never been under siege. <clears throat> the biggest problem you have is that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Chick-fil-A, where are you today, right? I mean, that's the biggest problem you have. Or there's a long line. There's a long line at the fast food. Oh, I'm not going to wait 15 minutes. I'm out of here. That's, I mean, that's the extent of your difficulties, right? Everybody say, this is bad. And how many of y'all know, know there must have been a lot of pressure on, on Hezekiah to just end this thing, right? In the, I mean, because any, any parent will tell you, it's, I mean, you can deal with things. It's easier to deal with things when you have symptoms in your body than when your kids have symptoms in your body. Because when your kids have symptoms in their body, you look at them and you just, man, you got you to you stay focused. You got to stay focused. You got to stay focused. Right? I mean, can you imagine watching families all around the city uh, starving? I mean, it would, be a, it would be a difficult thing. Amen? Verse 13. Then the commander stood and called in, out in Hebrew. There he goes. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. The city will, be, will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And really, this is right here where the deal was sealed. Because he was mocking the name of God. And how many of you know you cannot mock God? Galatians 6, 9. Do not be deceived. Do not be what? Deceived. Do not be what? Do not be what? Deceived. I don't care what they say. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. But he sealed his deal, but you got to learn how to respond to these wicked threats. Verse 16. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own fig, excuse me, his own vine and fig tree. And drink water from his own cistern. Now, as they are sitting there hungry, and he, these words are coming out of his mouth, can you imagine the visions they had in their heads? I mean, can you imagine? They probably had visions of them sitting there eating and drinking water and thinking, oh my gosh, wow, wow. wow that would be fantastic, right? Verse 17, until, everybody say until. Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. I mean, if you do your historical study of the Assyrians, he's lying. They were, they were mean, evil, wicked people. I mean, you think Guantanamo Bay is bad? Well, we make them listen to Britney Spears music 24 hours a day. I mean, that is bad. <laughs> you think that's bad? I mean, we got we to wake up to reality. We got to wake up to the reality. The Assyrians had several ways of dealing with things, and they operated in fear. Fear was what they did. They were, they were an early terrorists. There's no doubt about it. That was by fear. Everybody say fear. fear. He was lying. Verse 18. Do not, let, do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? 
uh, excuse me, Assyria. Now, Israel isn't and is not like any other nation. You are not like any other person. Anybody here giving their life to Jesus Christ? Who's here giving their life to Jesus Christ? Then guess what? You're not like everybody else. You're a child of the king. Israel, Judah, was the, was the chosen of God. It was not, not just like any other nation. I don't care what happened to any other nation. I don't care what happened to any other false god. I don't care what happens. I don't care what happens to any other's lives. Tell me about what happens to the children of God, because that's what I'm a part of. That's what I am in. Verse 19. Where are the gods of Hamath and Erpod? Where are the gods of Sheraphim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all these gods, these countries, have been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent. They did what? They remained what? Silent. silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded them, do not answer him. You don't have to answer wicked people. Doesn't matter what you say. That's not my job. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to go to the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's not what we're called to do. Yeah, but I, someone needs to stand, I need to stand up for myself. Well, you can stand up for yourself and get your own results, but you're not going to like them very much. Or, I mean, read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, talking about walking in love. It says that you do not repay evil with evil, you repay evil with good, and you leave room for God's wrath. That's New Testament. Leave room for God's wrath. God can take care of you. How many of y'all know God can take care of you? Amen. 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 God can take care of you. Verse 22. Then Elikim, son of Helikai, and the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told them what the field commander had said. Okay, so we got this dilemma all set up. This is where they are. Now, we've been talking about how to write your own ticket with God. How to write your own ticket with God. What are the four steps we've been talking about? Number one is what? Say it. Everybody say, say it. Say it. Number two is what? Do it. Number three is what? Receive it. And number four is what? Tell it. Tell it. Say it, do it, receive it, and tell it. Now, we're going to see those four steps right here on how they got their hander, how they got their answer. So how do you handle the threats of the wicked? Step number one, say it. So Isaiah said it. Look at the next chapter, Isaiah chapter 37. Then when King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on the sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. Where did Hezekiah go? Oh, I know. He went to social media. No, he went to where? To the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priest, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, and when children come to the point of death, excuse me, to the point of birth, there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the, fi of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God. Sent to do what? Ridicule, ridicule the living God. How many of y'all know we serve the living God? Amen? Amen. And that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives. Verse 5, when King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, tell your master, this is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. I mean, we could stop there for two weeks and do a series on this is what the Lord says. Everybody say that. Say, this is what the Lord says. Why, 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 why are you always talking about confession? Because you need to say over your life, this is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. Yeah, but I, I, I got people on my job and two, they're against me and they're in high places. There's no way I can get around. This is what the Lord says. Well, in my body, I don't, I don't feel so hot. You know, I, I got this problem. I got, this is what the Lord says. That's why when you come in here, we're not going to cry with you. We're going to tell you, this is what the Lord says. 
This is what, what? The Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words which, that with, excuse me, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I am going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country and there I will have him cut down with the sword. So what's God saying? Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I've heard him. Listen, when someone speaks evil over your life, God hears. Amen. Amen. He hears and he knows and it's recorded and he will take care of it if you will respond the correct way. He, he hears it. He hears it. So Isaiah said it. Now remember, step number two is what? Do it. And Hezekiah what? He did it. Now, think about how hard this is. I mean, think about how hard this must have been. There they are under siege. There they're hungry. They're thirsty. All those things. And he gets a message back from the man of God that says, don't you be afraid and don't you back down. Now imagine Hezekiah's job going to the people to tell them this. I mean, can you imagine? How many of you know there must have been some grumblers in there somewhere? How many of you all think, yeah? Anybody ever been a part of a team before, right? Anybody had to do a group project at school, which is from the devil himself, right? Right, because there's always, they, oh, you do that. Okay, well, what are you going to do? Oh, I'll just make sure it's okay. No, you help, right? I mean, all, I, mean, I mean, there must have been all kinds of things going along, but what? Hezekiah stood to the plate and stood on what the man of God said. He did it. Everybody said, he did it. There was no food, there was no water, they were drinking their own urine, they were eating their own feces, and, as, and so King Hezekiah faced a dilemma. Surrender to the king of Assyria and hope for the best? You cannot appease them. I hope you see this happening in our culture. We want a cake baked for us, okay? Well, then we want you to be at pushed out. You know, we want this, then we want... Th I mean, it's step after step after step after step. You can't appease the world. You can't appease the wicked. You can't appease them. It's impossible. Tell your neighbor, say, it's impossible. It's impossible. Now, I know there's this thought in the Christian world going around that if we're just nice enough, they're going to like us. It's a lie. It's a lie. The wicked will never like the godly. They're wicked. They're wicked. Somebody that, somebody that sees no problem in killing unborn children. How am I, how am I supposed to have a conversation with that person? That doctor, that abortion doctor, they found all those corpses of all those little unborn babies, like in his garage or something. That's just, that's just sick. I mean, do you all, I mean, I hope you agree with me. I mean, that's just, that's just sick. I mean, that person will never like me, which is, I'm cool with that, <laughs> right? I'm cool with that, right? You will never appease, and if you read, go, go back and read uh, the Exodus, go back and read them leaving Egypt. Moses kept saying, let my people go, and Pharaoh kept coming back saying, well, what about this compromise? Or what about this compromise? Well, what about this compromise? What about this compromise? And Moses kept saying, no, you will let us go on our own free will. No, I'm not going to compromise. No, I'm not going to compromise. No, I'm not going to compromise. Don't compromise. Tell your neighbor, say, don't compromise. Don't compromise. Hezekiah had a choice. Would he put his hope in the king of Assyria and hope for the best? Or will he defy the king of Assyria and put all of his trust in the Lord? Hezekiah did it. Everybody say, Hezekiah did it. Hezekiah. Isaiah had said in Isaiah 37, 6 and 7, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you've heard, those words of which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I'm going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. So Hezekiah did it. He didn't surrender. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God he didn't surrender. He didn't yield to the king of Assyria. Isaiah said it, and Hezekiah did it. 
But sometimes victories don't come easy, do they? Right? So, of course, there's another round of threats. There's another round of threats. Isaiah chapter 37, starting in verse 9. Uh, he received a report about the Cushite king of Egypt was marching out to fight against them. When he heard this, remember what Isaiah had said. Remember what Isaiah said. Isaiah had said, when he hears a certain report, he will return to his country, and there I'll have him cut down with the sword. So here he is. Now the king of Assyria is on the run because he's got another king coming after him, but yet he still wants to make Judah pay. He sent his messengers to Hezekiah with this word, verse 10. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Again, what's, who is he mocking? He's mocking God. Surely you have heard what the king of Assyria had done to all the countries. Destroying them what? Completely. Destroying them what? Completely. Completely. I mean, the Assyrians, they would take out, they would take women, open them up, and kill the unborn child right there. I mean, they, they destroyed, they destroyed cultures. They destroyed cities. They weren't about, hey, why don't you come be a part of us? Right? We're not talking about democracy here. Look at this, verse 12. Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them? And he goes on talking about, look, I, we've defeated this God. We've defeated another God. We've defeated this God. We defeated that God. What makes your God so special? Well, guess what? We serve the living God. I said, we serve the living God. Amen. This is how wicked people operate. They make threats from a position of weakness. They make threats from a position of weakness. He's withdrawing and he's still mocking God and still making threats. Still mocking God and still making threats. Have you ever had somebody, maybe, I don't know, a relative or somebody mock you and make fun of your lifestyle while their life is falling apart? I mean, their life is falling apart, literally falling apart. But yet they want to mock you. I mean, it's like, like, dude, just focus on your own life, man. Amen. Why are you so concerned about me going to church? Look, look, you, you can't stop drinking. You have no money. Your kids hate you. Just stop. Right? You want to, that's what wicked people do. I mean, their lives are falling apart but they still want to mock and make threats. So what does Hezekiah do? Remember step number two, what? Do it. Everybody say, do it. do it. So Hezekiah does what you and I should always do, and that's he takes it to the Lord. Look what he says here. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. He went to the temple of what? the Lord. He went out to the temple of what? The Lord. I mean, sometimes we have people around uh, over the years. See, I've seen people that they have a situation come up in their life and they're not happy about it. And it's not good. But instead of running to the doors of the church, they run as far away as they possibly can. It, cease, it never ceases to amaze me. If you get a bad report, how many of y'all know the first place you should be is in the house of the Lord? Amen. I mean, I mean, if you get if you get a report that is not good or someone say threats against you, how I many all know the place you should be is in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. So he, he lays it out before the Lord. Look at verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Now, I want to stop right here and I want to show you something that what Hezekiah does. Now, that, go and put that verse back up there. That verse looks like a lot of great religious lingo. Have you ever heard someone pray, and it's like they're praying, and it's, as you can tell, it's just like they're reciting something? Oh, God! <laughs> I was doing a funeral one time, and uh, I was doing it with someone else, and uh, I got up and I, I prayed my prayer, and this person got up and went, Oh God, great and majesty. And I mean, just went through this whole thing. And I could tell it didn't mean nothing to him. He's just saying words, right? But how many of y'all know Hezekiah is not just here saying words? Look what he's saying here. Oh Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. 
You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. What is Hezekiah doing? He's turning his focus off the things that he can see to the things that he can't see. This is what's so awesome about prayer. When you pray, you are focusing on not what is seen, but you're focusing on what is what? Unseen. What's Hezekiah saying here? He's saying, God, who is on the throne, and you read Isaiah, you read Ezekiel, you talk about the cherubim flying back and forth, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You know, 2 Corinthians tells us to not look at what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is what? Eternal. And if you are going to receive what you desire from the Lord, if you're going to be able to stand up under pressure, and this was a big time pressure situation, you're going to have to learn how to walk by the Spirit and focus on the unseen, not focus on what you see with your eyes around you. I love it. A junior year over here at St. Paul's, I get to teach the juniors. We do the book God's Plan for Man by Phineas Dake. Finest, excuse me, Phineas Dake. And in that, man, we talk about all kinds of things. One of the things we talk about angels, the reality of angels. We talk about the description of angels. We talk about the fact there's angels everywhere. We talk about the fact of what angels are doing. We talk about what demons are doing. We talk about how demons are fallen angels. We talk about, we talk about I want them to know the reality of the spiritual world because the spiritual world is more important than the physical world. It's way more important because the spiritual will change the physical because the physical is temporary. The spiritual is eternal. Yeah. You don't think there's angels around this property right here right now? There sure are. And you don't think they're bad dudes? They sure are. Read your Bible. Read about it when men's, men come across angels. They never said, ah, he looked a little weak. <laughs> no, these are it's a big, I mean, they're, they're not humans, they're persons. They're persons. They have bodies. They have, they have, they have, they have intellect. They have, I have all the, I mean, they have all these capabilities. They see, they hear, they see, they hear, they talk, all those type things. That is more real. And this is what Hezekiah had to do. God, I need to get focused back on you because if I look out there and see everybody in the suffering, I'm going to, I might, I might compromise. No, but when I look at you and I know that you're on the throne and that you're all powerful and you're strong and you do exactly what your word says you'll do, I know everything's going to be okay. Everybody say everything's going to be okay. Verse 17, give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words that sent to insult the living God. It is, it is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to all the people in the lands. Verse 19, they have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Listen to what he says here. Listen to what he says here. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O oh Lord, are God. Don't deliver me so I have it easy. Deliver me so that they may know that your hand is on my life. Deliver me so that the world may know that, O oh Lord, you are God. Everybody say, O oh Lord, you are God. Just like that testimony we read, right? The testimony I read. What did he say? I give all God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Not just that. I mean, how many of y'all could handle making a full year's bonus but only working a quarter of the year? Oh, yeah. Amen. Some of y'all are like, no, I'm not impressed. <laughs> you would be if you got it, yeah, right? But now, that, now that family is going to be enabled to give more into the kingdom of God than they ever have before. I'm telling you, God is working, God is working, God is working, God is moving. If, if, if you will go to the Lord, don't, don't, you don't need to respond to them. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, you hear what they're saying. I trust you. I believe in you. I believe in your word. I believe that what you say will come to pass. Amen? Look at Isaiah chapter 37, verse 29, speaking to the king of Assyria. He said, because you rage against me, and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. Boom. 
There it is. How many of y'all believe God's alive? Amen. How many of y'all believe he's real? Amen. Step number three, receive it. Hezekiah received it. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. 185,000 men in one night. <laughs> I don't want to mess with them. <laughs> Amen. I want to have them on my side. Amen. When the people got up the next morning, there were all there, there were all the dead bodies. So the king of Assyria broke camp and withdrew. I, I, I would too, wouldn't you? All right. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Well, I guess he would, wouldn't he? And one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nishrach, his sons, Adremelech and Sherezah, uh, cut him down with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Eret. And his son succeeded him as king. So guess what? The very thing that God said would happen to him, guess what? It happened. And God has a way of doing things. There he was in the temple of his false god. And his sons come and kill him. You, when you become a Christian, you are not weak. You are not outnumbered. You are not, you are not behind. You are not at a disadvantage. You are at an advantage. You are a child of the king. And whatever wicked threats are made against you, it shall fall. Amen. And you shall succeed and you shall prosper, and your family shall be together, and you shall do all the great things that God has called you to do. Why? Because you realized and understood that you don't have to fight in your own strength. You take it to the Lord. The Lord is my source. Everybody say, the Lord is my source. Lord is my source. Say it one more time. Say, the Lord is my source. Lord is my source. Say it again. The Lord is my source. How many of y'all believe that? Amen? Amen. 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 The Lord is your source. Yeah. 